Hello and welcome again to Airing Pain, the programme brought to you by Pain Concern, a UK-based charity working to help, support and inform people living with pain and healthcare professionals. This edition has been funded by an Awards for All grant from the Big Lottery Fund in Wales. As adult nurses we are very keen, or, or go quite often first of all for medication, rather than looking for alternative ways of managing people in pain and it's helping patients to recognise there are other ways of managing chronic pain rather than just going straight for the medication and all the side effects that that carries really. In this edition of Airing Pain I've come to the University of South Wales to see how a group of student nurses are given an insight into how they might help people with chronic pain in their future careers. And this is a good time to join them because this is the very last lecture of their three-year degree course in adult nursing. It's taken by senior lecturer Gareth Parsons, who, when he was a clinical nurse specialist in pain management, developed nurse-led chronic pain clinics in acupuncture, TNS and relaxation therapy. Today is going to be a little bit different. We're going to expose you to some of the interventions that people with chronic pain might experience. And these are all interventions that are delivered by nurses. So we've got massage, which is going to be done by Maria Parry. We had a patient who'd actually broken his spine and he used to come back and forth for respite every six weeks. And he had extreme pain issues from spasms in his legs and from cramp. He never had a good night's sleep constantly moving, move, and he could, his pain issues meant that he could never get comfortable. A winner is going to be doing relaxation. It's peak time for assessments and stuff, so there's just been a, one assignment handed in, and now the dissertation is sort of out there a bit, isn't it? Yeah. So are you all feeling stressed? Yeah. Or some of you maybe not, but there are underlying signs that maybe you are? Crying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Crying. Yeah. Yes. Crying. Yes. Crying. Yes. And just generally feeling. And I am a nurse yeah. acupuncturist. If you look on this chart here, you'll see around the size of the head, there's loads of acupuncture points. The cranial nerves got loads of little supplies to all the skin and the muscles around this area. Very easy to stimulate with pressure. So basically, just rubbing the side of your head here. You probably do this, don't you? Yeah. It's to give you food for thought about other ways that you can help people in pain. And it's also to make you think about pain in a different way to maybe how you think about it at the moment. So with that in mind, I have a question for you. Do you feel there's any difference between acute, chronic and palliative pain? I mean, what do you feel differentiates them? Length of time. Length of time. Type of pain. Do you think there might be differences in the type of pain somebody experiences? Okay, so differences in intensity or recurrence, you know, whether it's there all the time. Severity, maybe. Severity. So you've captured some of the things I've said. You've also maybe come up with some of the myths which we're going to explore. If you look at definitions of these different types of pains in the textbooks, this is what they say. So acute pain, recent onset. It could be something that happens for an instant such as when you have a needle stick, we are going to have an injection, or it could be something that lasts for a few minutes or a few hours. Most people would say acute pain is something that lasts less than three months. We often think that acute pain has a causal relationship, so you know what's caused the pain, it's immediate. That toothache is caused by your dental carry. you might have an injury, there might be an underlying disease which is causing the pain. And it's possible to estimate the length of duration. We could think of it as having an end point. And you actually see these things called pain trajectory. So they can actually map out what the classic acute pain would be for somebody who's had a, a hernia repair after surgery or somebody who is in labour. People have actually mapped these out, what the characteristics of this pain is, how long it's going to last, and you can see the differences between them. If we look at palliative pain, the length of it varies. We mustn't just think about palliative as being in the terminal phases. If you talk to Maria about palliative care, she'd say it's actually about when you change from active treatment to prolonged life to treatment to invoke quality of life. It depends upon the nature of the disease because most people think of palliative care as being about cancer, but it also can be about other chronic diseases. And it usually, but not always, worsens as the disease progresses. But there is a causal relationship due to the disease or due to treatments. 
If we look at chronic pain, you've all picked up that chronic pain is something that has a long duration. And the actual idea about chronic pain has been described in various ways. Most definitions would agree that it's something that's persisted for more than six months. Some would say more than three months. Others would look at other criteria for it. This means that the pain has persisted beyond normal healing processes. And what it might mean is there might not be an identifiable cause for the pain. And the duration of chronic pain is unlimited and there's no certainty of end. It's very rare that chronic pain is cured. And I've looked after people who were born in pain and have lived 80 years in pain, as well as people who have acquired pain through something that's happened to them in their lives. So imagine what it would be like to be in pain for 80 years. So I want you to think back last year about there being two main broad categories of pain. The first one is nociceptive pain. This is pain where your nervous system is essentially healthy and intact. The second one is neuropathic pain. This is pain where your nervous system is involved in some way in producing the pain or making a pain that, that exists worse. So there's something that's happened to the nervous system. Now these are quite clear cut things to look at when you're looking at acute pain. But when you look at chronic pain, what happens is the nervous system changes. So there, there is physiological changes that go on in the nervous system, which actually can make what starts off as a nociceptive normal pain into having some of the characteristics of a neuropathic pain because of the, the nervous system is plastic, it changes, it alters. So because of this complexity, there's been this declaration that chronic pain is a major healthcare problem in its own right. This is the European Federation of the International Association for Study of Pain chapter declaration that pain is a problem in its own right. This has been supported by the European Parliament and also it's been debated at the British Parliament. So if we think about why chronic pain is a problem in its own right, it's because the cause of the pain might not be apparent. If you try and link chronic pain to a disease and there's no sign of a disease, what are you saying to the person with chronic pain? That your pain doesn't exist? And one of the problems that we have with pain is we view pain through the lens of a biopsychosocial model. However, in reality, we pay lip service to it. The reality is people in chronic pain have a lot of focus on the biology, some focus on the psychology, and very little focus on the sociology. We do need to think about what's caused the chronic pain or what the etiology is. More importantly, I would argue what the patient's story is about their chronic pain, what their narrative is. We should listen to what they say and believe what they say and adjust our thinking so it's in tune with what they are thinking about their pain. And what we should aim to do is reduce the risk of developing chronic pain. Because once somebody's got chronic pain, it's much harder to manage than if you can stop somebody getting entrenched in their chronic pain. So we need early appropriate assessment. We need to believe the patient. Remember the cause matters, but it's not the only factor. It's not the most important factor either. More importantly, we need clear communication. We need to explain things logically and in a way that people can understand instead of throwing jargon at them. We need to clarify misconceptions that people have because that's a way to tackle harmful pain behaviours. Um, we need to tackle fears and anxieties. We should take a balanced holistic approach, not just focused on the biological. And we should aim for good, earlier, appropriate pain relieving methods. And they would not necessarily include drugs. Drugs with people with chronic pain can become part of the problem rather than the solution. Hopefully I've given you some food for thought and challenge the way you think a little bit about chronic pain. And I hope you enjoy the experience of having some relaxation, a hand massage, and me having my opportunity of revenge by putting some acupuncture needles in you. I know I'll enjoy that bit. Any questions? I'm Maria Perry, and I'm a senior lecturer in palliative care. Um, I'm a massage therapist, and today we are teaching the third year students alternative ways of looking at chronic pain management. So getting them to think about using other therapies in relation to chronic pain management by experiencing some of those therapies themselves. Right, okay, are you all settled? Yes? Whenever we think of pain, we think of pillbox. Now, I was lucky enough Oh, quite a few years ago um, as a staff nurse to be given the opportunity to train as a massage therapist and work within the trust. So they trained six of us 
at the time. And I started to see that by using very simple massage for patients, the benefits were phenomenal. So what we are going to look at is a basic hand massage. I am looking at using massage techniques and putting them into a very simple hand massage that in essence you can use some of these things you'll pick up today on any patient without calling a massage if you were putting some cream on somebody's hand or feet this transfers exactly to the feet and i will talk about that as well so you could use some of these techniques if you knew somebody had a chronic pain issue if you wanted to refer them to somebody else or you could sort of sit there and think, oh, well, do you know, there could be a sort of five minutes that I'm sat here putting some cream on, that may help. And a lot of this is about the relaxing. We're not treating anybody. And if you look at the contraindications to massage, they are as long as your arm. So you wouldn't massage somebody. And a lot of people who might have chronic pain problems would probably have a lot of the contraindications. They might well have sort of arthritis. They might have poor skin. They might have scars they might have inflammation so you have to put it in perspective if you were looking at something you have to look at the benefit versus the risk but we are looking at something that is incredibly relaxing i'm not looking at treating anybody with this right okay so basically get as near as you can yeah hence the comfy clothes i always try and say no short skirts today because it's always interesting in the way. <laughs> so get in as close as you can i'm using a very basic grape seed oil okay it's one of the best carrier oils for massage sometimes if you go to see a massage therapist now a lot of them will use a mousse almond oil lovely very expensive obviously think of allergies so you have to think about the kind of oil that you're using and that's already highlighted some issues in clinical practice if you are going to use oils to do this and use it as a therapist you have to think about consent etc you too right okay we've got enough for a partner each so what I want you to do is roll your sleeves up, get a chair opposite, okay? Get your pillow and your towel. So spread out and use the floor. So come this way and spread out to the middle of my floor. Becky, this is your last lecture in a three-year nursing course. And this is the first time you've actually come across chronic okay. pain. Many Years ago, I worked as a pain specialist medical secretary and also worked in a phys physiotherapy practice. So maybe it's because I worked with physiotherapy at the same time. Maybe it's how this type of thing, I see the benefit because I've already seen the benefit in the past. I like to have a Thai massage sometimes, so I see the benefit in that myself. <laughs> Bethan, you're having a massage given by Becky. Were you surprised about anything in the lecture this morning about difference between chronic pain and acute pain? I actually have done a placement up in Abruthin, which is a palliative care um, environment. So it's something that you know I've, I've been used to. I'm stopping the massage process. How's it, how's it going? It's lovely, really nice. This is somebody with complex regional pain syndrome, type one. This is, photograph was taken in June, and it was a very hot June day. This is how he walked into the pain clinic. What do you see? We didn't ask him to take his shirt off, by the way. So he came in without a shirt on. If you saw this person walking down the street, because this is the way he walks around the street, you think he's a mental health patient just by looking at him. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, he actually said to me, Gareth, people think I'm a loony. But this is the only way I can control my pain without using drugs. So what we're seeing is a series of different kind of pain behaviours, all right? This is his original site of injury, his wrist. Fell over, fractured his wrist. Healed up lovely. Orthopaedic surgeons were really happy with him, sent him away. After a week of his injury, he was complaining about having this burning pain all the time, but they just thought, oh, it'll settle down, it'll settle down, it'll settle down. Five years later, he comes to us in the pain clinic in this state. He's got this expansion of his original pain area. In fact, the whole of his arm is in pain, and most of his torso, he experiences pain. The reason why he's not wearing a shirt is just the feeling of clothes on his skin causes him pain. He has this altered sensation. He's also got something we call cold allodynia. So cold causes him pain. What, just on that arm? Just on his hand, right. around the site of the original injury, a breeze in the room 
going over him, causes skin, causes him pain. The other thing he has is mechanical allodynia. When he came in, this guy took his, a sling off because he keeps his arm in a sling all the time, all right? which has caused him a problem with his shoulder. He actually has what we would term in lay terms a frozen shoulder because he just wears a sling all the time. Because every time he moves his wrist, it causes him pain. So that's why he's resting his wrist on his leg. He's also got excessive counter stimulation. What he's doing on the top of his arm is he's taking a cigarette and burning his skin because that releases pain. He was referred to psychiatrists by the orthopedic surgeons as somebody who self-harms. He came to us after being treated by the psychiatrist for suicide. He didn't, never had any suicidal thoughts, but they treated him with antidepressive drugs because he'd been referred for his self-harming behaviour. Also, he's got a tuber grip on here, but it's not actually doing anything other than telling other people that he's got a problem with his arm. So if you walk around with a sling on and a tuber grip on your elbow, you get sympathy from people. They, they're careful around you, they don't bump into you. He hasn't actually got an injury in his arm, the injury's in his wrist, but the tuber grip is more prominent. So it's a pain display behaviour. You've just said you think he's a, a lunatic. So what does he think of you? This is from my research, and it's looking at patients' perceptions of healthcare professionals. And basically, for patients, you are the problem. Members of the general public are problematic as well, but you're the real problem, because you're the ones they turn to for help, and you don't help them. You actually make their situation worse. And the way you do this um, is you don't believe them, or you're not interested in them, or you treat them like they're an item to be processed. Come in, see us, do this, have this treatment, go away. And they feel they only get help if they demand it. But when they demand it, they get labelled as angry and aggressive, and that gets put in their notes. And then next time they come in, they have to make sure they have an appointment where there's somebody else there to protect the doctor. And their chronic pain is treated as if it's an acute pain. Because the main way that you deal with it is to throw drugs at it. And you throw drugs at it that work on a healthy nervous system. And if you don't believe me, this is from my research. This is uh, prescriptions for chronic pain at a typical Welsh GP. Size of practice is around about 12,000, which is about typical for a GP in this area. In my research, I was trying to recruit people who had chronic pain, but the GP didn't actually keep chronic pain as a, a label in their computer systems to identify them. So I had to find proxy ways of doing it. Okay? So I thought, well, how many people in this practice have been prescribed analgesia for at least six months? That's one way of finding out if you've got chronic pain. If chronic pain lasts for six months, let's look at the number of analgesia. 15% of this practice are taken relatively strong to very strong opioids. Now, have a look at those who are on drugs which are known to treat chronic pain. Drugs like gabapentin or pregabalin, fairly commonly prescribed nowadays for people with chronic pain, or have been referred to a pain clinic, or to orthopaedics or rheumatology, or referred to a physiotherapist, or to the enhanced practitioner physiotherapist. Only 78 patients, only 0.63%. So 15% of patients should be having help if they're only strong analgesics, they've had pain for more than six months, it needs to be looked at. In the UK, the average time it takes to get to a pain clinic is five years. By then, your pain is truly embedded in you. It's an unseen problem. Up to 11% of the people in the community, it's been estimated to have chronic pain. Some surveys put it higher. And very small numbers are referred to specialists for pain treatment. There's seven health boards in Wales. Six out of seven of them have a pain clinic. Six out of seven, have a pain management programme. There's not enough services out there. There's a result in delayed access, increased problems, and imagine what it's like if you've got pain and nobody's gonna help you, and you go to people who can't help you because they don't know how to help you. My name's Owenna Simpson, and I'm one of the senior lecturers for adult nursing. And uh, in this session, we're gonna do some relaxation therapy, looking at um, managing chronic pain. I've been qualified for 20 years and my background is all cardiology and cardiac surgery. Uh, and prior to coming into the university, I was a heart failure specialist nurse. As a cardiology nurse, what can you teach nurses for chronic pain? As adult nurses, we are very keen or, or go quite often, first of all, for medication rather than looking for alternative ways of managing people in pain. And it's helping patients to recognise there are other ways of managing chronic pain rather than just going straight for the medication and all the side effects that that carries really. And relaxation is important. Relaxation is very important and it's something we can all do with a bit of practice, something that people can do at home so they don't need expert people, they can 
buy different sort of CDs and different other aids and just find something that's, that works for them. Well, I do, and it does. <laughs> there we are. At the moment, it's probably um, maybe the right or wrong time. So it's peak time for assessments and stuff. So there's just been a, one assignment handed in and now the dissertation is sort of out there a bit, isn't it? Yeah. So are you all, well, not all, some of you feeling stressed? Yeah. Or some of you maybe not, but there are underlying signs that maybe you are? Yeah. What sort of things? That you know? Crying. Yeah. Okay, so crying. Yes. Yeah. 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 And just having colds all the time? Oh. And just generally feeling just feeling on edge. Uh, yeah. yeah. Not being very yeah. nice to other people. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you're quite snappy to people? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More snappy than normal then. Yeah. Sleep? Yeah. So that's your sign of stress, is that you will sleep? Other people will go to sleep, wake up early, yeah. and they just can't get to sleep. So that we all sort of manage things quite differently. Cold sores and stuff, oh, that's yeah. always mine. If I say oh, cold sores. No, another one's bad in, I'm sure. Yeah, tingle, tingle. Mm, the signs are there. And is it healthy for us to be stressed then? No. No? no? Not at all? Ever? Yeah. 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 Do we do we need to be a little bit stressed just to get up in the morning and to do yeah. things? Yeah. So a little bit of stress is okay, and that's healthy, but the problem is when it's sustained. So rather than listen to me now too much more, we'll find a space on the floor and have a practice of relaxation <laughs> methods, okay? Some of you will go to sleep, some of you will. No problem, really. I don't need it. Are we ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Imagine how it will never be rushed and to do one thing. Okay, so I'm gonna show you this acupuncture needle. Don't get panicked, all right? This is one that you might use in a very large person around the bottom. These ones are stainless steel disposable needles. You use them once, you throw them away. That's important with uh, acupuncture. Don't use reusable needles. Does the needle hurt? Yeah. Most people's experience of having a needle is having an injection, isn't it? Yeah. If you look at the long, big needle that's passing yeah. around, I don't know if it's got over to you yeah. over there. Yeah. Two of those needles will fit inside the lumen, the hole of a green uh, injection needle. They're designed to slide through tissue, not to cut tissue. But what can be uh, strange is finding the acupuncture sensation. I learned all this in the 90s. And since the 90s, we've had the development of fMRI scans. And with fMRI scans, we can actually demonstrate that something happens when you put an acupuncture needle in somebody. Where somebody's brain is activated with pain, the acupuncture stimulation produces a switching off of that pain activation. The surmise is that it's because your body's own endogenous opioid pathways are activated. These are the drugs in your body produced which are similar to morphine. Because when we give people morphine, the same thing happens. But interestingly, when you give somebody a placebo, the same thing happens. We do know placebo has a powerful effect in chronic pain. Actually, these are used in veterinary practice for pigs and horses and cows. Now this is the interesting thing, it seems to work, and do horses and pigs have the same placebo effect as a human being? My belief though, based on my audit data, is that something is going on with nociceptive pain, because in my experience, those people who I gave acupuncture to, who had typical nociceptive type pains, headaches, joint pains, knee pains, low back pains without surgery, they had beneficial effects. Those people who had some kind of neuropathic element, like post neuralgia or multiple cirrhosis, I didn't help them with their pain. So I think that there's something to do with the opioid pathways. So any, anyone want to have a... Yeah? So that's a needle in. Right. God, doesn't it at all, does it? No, I'm just oh, that's weird. Oh, I can feel that now. Yeah? Oh. So that's that day key effect. Mm. That's achy, isn't it? Yeah. So you just leave it in there now, well, do some I? Some people feel it as a dull ache. Other people have a more stronger sensation. I don't want to in thanks. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do I leave it in now? Yeah, leave it in. I'll touch it. I've got a deep so I'll have a swim, so please don't hurt me. Yeah. That's weird. It's weird, isn't it? I'm looking at your face so I can that's see your face weird. change. That's weird, yeah. It. Oh, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. Is <laughs> <laughs> mm. it a key sensation? Mm, I don't like it. I don't like no? it at all. No. Okay. 
Do you want me to take it out or leave it in? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. There's always one in every group. Mom, don't worry. I'm sorry. I don't. Oh. <laughs> I don't Are these the nurses who are going to be sticking needles in me for the next? Oh, that's not too bad. Yeah. Twenty years. What do you mean? One thing to inflict pain on somebody else, but to have it yourself. It's a... As you're swapping over, I'll tell you a story about one of the benefits too of a patient that I had. When I was a staff nurse, I was a staff nurse in a community hospital not far from where I lived, and I worked there for about five years. And we used to have a lot of patients with chronic pain problems, and we used to have a lot of patients that came back and forth for respite. So we had a patient who'd actually broken his spine and he used to come back and forth for respite every six weeks. And he had extreme pain issues from spasms in his legs and from cramp. Consequently, he used to buzz about 30 times a night. He never had a good night's sleep, constantly moving, move, and he could, his pain issues meant that he could never get comfortable. So when I did this course, I went back and I said, how do you fancy if we try something new? So when he came in, I said, right, okay, Let's get you sorted, we'll massage your legs and we'll see what happens. So by the time I'd finished, he'd be laying in the bed like this. And he was quite funny because he used to swear like a trooper. And for some reason he used to call me Mo. Don't really not sure why, he'd be like, Mo, move me. And you know, we had a bit of banter and whatever, but so anyway, he'd lay there now and I'd say, Chair, not be funny now, I said, let's see if we can manage to sleep. But you know what, he did sleep. After two weeks of being admitted, then you saw a real difference in his sleep pattern. The downside was that I obviously only worked five days a week. Some of those were day shifts. So when I was days, I used to go back at nine because I only lived down the road. <laughs> drag, up, drag up my daughter, who was only about one at the time in a child seat, chuck her in the office, go and do his legs. And he'd be like, oh. Now there was an issue there and I had a real ethical issue with this in the end because when he went home for six weeks we had real problems in finding somebody to actually go and do. We did find somebody in the end that could do that on an intermittent basis because the benefit was obvious and you just wanted to say to people sometimes there might be not a huge amount out there written and there might not be a huge amount of some of our researchers would call it proper evidence but the evidence is there. And if you look at the benefits that it can have for patients, it is just phenomenal. And he was a real good example of how it can work. That's Maria Parry, Senior Lecturer in Palliative Care at the University of South Wales. Now, I'll just give you the usual words of caution that whilst we believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. All editions of Airing Pain are available for download from Pain Concern's website and CD copies can be obtained direct from Pain Concern. All the contact details, should you wish to make a comment about these programmes via our blog, message board, email, Facebook, Twitter or even pen and paper, are at our website which is painconcern.org.uk. The last words to Maria Parry. From a palliative perspective, it's maybe given me more thoughts of using non-drug related therapies because of the link between hospice and therapies widely used in hospice care and acknowledged in hospice care as being useful and I think sometimes it's maybe a little bit sad that we don't acknowledge these things these other therapies can be so useful to patients obviously in many palliative care centres they're free so palliative case patients will often be referred to a therapist that will give them a massage once a week not have to go and pay for it once a week because I don't think sometimes they think patients with chronic pain well they won't be able to access all these services and that that is also something that we need to consider so it would be nice to see more people which is why I think this day is so important that they leave you they will remember oh with a lovely massage and oh yeah that was to do with pain and if that's all they do is put those two things together then I think we've done something that is useful in relation to patients with pain. Otherwise, they'll just go out and just think, oh, let's give them some morphine or cocodamol or whatever, and necessarily it's not going to be beneficial to all patients. So. Okay, we done? We done? Yes, done.